We've already looked at a lot of different phylogenetic trees. Now, we're finally going to talk about what they are, how to read them, and how we came up with them in the first place. Now we're gonna talk about phylogenetics. This is one of my very favorite fields and it's responsible for all of these beautiful tree diagrams that you've probably seen a few times before. Well, buckle up, because there's a lot to talk about. We're gonna start off talking about what is phylogenetics in the first place, then we'll go over how to read these trees because it's important that we be able to interpret them correctly. Then there are a bunch of specific terminology that we wanna be familiar with. We'll talk about what monophyletic, paraphyletic, and polyphyletic mean. Then we'll talk about simplesiomorphies and apomorphy and atopomorphy. Then we'll discuss the difference between clades and grades, and then we'll round it all out with a couple of different examples. So let's get started. What is this phylogenetics in the first place? The field of phylogenetics is the study of evolutionary relationships between species. So think of genealogy, except now we're looking on a really big scale. And instead of different people in your family, we're trying to figure out how different species are related. Um, so here we're also trying to figure out how species evolved, because once we know that pattern, we can get an idea of how evolution happened. But of course, the first thing we want to figure out is which species are closely related to each other. Phylogenetics is all about underst first understanding the pattern of evolution, and then it allows us to infer the process of evolution. So how do we even do this in the first place? There's a couple of different um, types of evidence or data that we can look at. Um, morphology is one thing, and this is the classic and the first type of evidence that was looked at, and that's when we look at, you know, the similarities in the bones. So we notice that in the four limbs of all tetrapods, we have the same different types of bones, and that's pretty good evidence that all tetrapods are closely related to each other to the exclusion of all water-dwelling animals. We can also look at behavior. Um, behavior is a little bit harder to look at. Behavior is a little bit more changeable. Um, but if there are some features that can give us um, some clues as to recent common ancestry. Um, in the past couple decades, the big thing we use to infer evolutionary history is, of course, genetics. There are about 3 billion base pairs in the human genome and, you know, slightly different numbers and different species. But that is a lot of data. And depending on which region of the genome you're looking at, some regions are, of course, affected by natural selection because, you know, genotype gives rise to phenotype, but not all parts of the genome are actually subject to natural selection. And there are certain parts of the genome which we do think evolve neutrally. And with that neutral evolution, we can generate st stochastic models for how we think it will evolve. And that gives us an idea of how to relate different species to each other. That's a much bigger topic than today, but just know that right now the golden standard for how we infer who's more closely related to whom is genetics. Um, if you look at the graphic on the bottom here, um, we actually have aligned sequences between different species here. We have a loach, tuna, trout, eel, seahorse, salamander, frog, and a panda. Um, and because we only have four base pairs, we um, tend to color them in. So, you know, G's are always blue, A is yellow, um, C is green and T is red. And you, so if you're looking vertically, you can see there are some spots where everybody has the same um, base pair. So in spaces one, two, three, four, and five, everyone has the same base pair. But you'll see in certain places we have more differences. Um, we, of course, use a computer to analyze it for us rather than just analyzing it visually. But it is helpful to understand what is going on. The goal here, whenever, well, no matter what type of data we're looking at, we are trying to find homologous traits. Um, to, and that will give us a clue as to who is more closely related to whom. We do have a specific methodology with certain philosophies, and this is called phylogenetic systematics. Another name you might hear this called by is cladistics. Um, this was uh, put together by Willy Hennig in the 1960s, I believe. Um, he was a German. Um, it took a, at least a decade for his methods to really um, travel throughout the rest of the scientific community because first he just wrote it in German, so it needed to be translated so more people could read it. Um, the key to his methodology here um, is the idea of shared derived characters, and that's what he emphasized. Um, and of course, keep in mind that if you're looking before the uh, 1970s or 1960s, um, we, people actually classified things differently because Billy Henning hadn't written his stuff yet. Um, but let's talk more about what phylogenetic systematics is um, in really. Um, 
what this comes back to is actually the idea of descent with modification. So going all the way back to Darwin and one of his major hypotheses. So under descent with modification, it you know hypothesizes that animals with more recent common ancestry will of course share more traits. So that means um, these shared derived traits give you evidence to say that these two animals are more closely related to each other than they are to anybody else. So if we look at this tree here as an example, we would find more similar characters between the striped skunk and the European otter than any other two. We would also find um, more traits in common between the coyote and the wolf. And by finding those traits, that is how someone was able to construct this tree in the first place. Because of course, if you're just going out in the world, you don't know what's more closely related. So we need to find that evidence to build these trees in the first place. But let's talk about an example here. So here we have three different animals. We have this beautiful red and blue lizard. Um, we have these adorable, cute little monkeys. Um, I think these are baby macaques. Um, and then of course we have a horse. There are many different features that we can look at but maybe we decide we wanna look at the number of digits on their hands and feet. So our lizard here has five, our monkey here has five, but our horse has one. So if we are looking at this trait, we might actually say, oh, the monkey is more closely related to the lizard than it is to the horse because they are similar in this trait but, um, and dissimilar to the horse. Of course, we know that's not true because the horse and monkey are both mammals. Um, so keep in mind that not all characters are equal and it really depends on what you're looking at, um, what sort of result you're going to give. When you are trying to figure out evolutionary history, only shared derived characters are helpful. So only shared derived characters will inform phylogenetics. Other traits actually confuse your answer like that example we just looked at. So it's not to say that these other traits aren't interesting and useful. They're just interesting for completely different reasons. Um, so we, whenever we are trying to figure out how different animals are related, we have to look at many different traits. Because just looking at an animal, you don't know what is a shared derived character at first. So at first you need to analyze a bunch of traits and then figure out which ones are those shared derived characters. So can you explain? What is phylogenetics?